Good evening. Welcome to the University of St. Francis. This is the um, latest and last for the semester of the series of public lectures uh, from the Department of Philosophy and Theology, of which I am a professor. My name is Adam DeVille, and I've been asked to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Professor Earl Comfer, um, who has been a professor here at the University of St. Francis since 1965. Um, and that uh, uh, gives him a um, what I often regard as a great uh, kind of historical memory of uh, this institution and uh, uh, perspective on many of its uh, challenges today. I can think of a, a debate we were having just last Friday, one of those famously heated debates over really very little that academics are infamous for, and we were back and forth with competing proposals about how to handle the question, and Earl just kind of quietly stuck up his hand and said, why don't we just leave this till the next meeting? You know, and you could tell in that that there was a perspective there that seemed to say, we've been down this road before, and we're not going to solve this right now, so let cooler heads prevail. And that kind of long-standing memory, I think, is very valuable. He came to us from uh, Catholic University of America with uh, undergraduate and graduate degrees in philosophy there, and then his uh, doctorate in the philosophy of language from the University of uh, Southern Illinois at Carbondale. Uh, his academic interests include uh, philosophical topics, bioethics, for example, uh, Franciscan philosophers like Duns Scotus, uh, more religious and theological topics, uh, such as interfaith and ecumenical uh, dialogue. And then in particular, uh, something from which we'll benefit tonight, uh, an ongoing interest in the intersection between science and religion, uh, especially with his involvement with uh, Metanexus and the uh, Midwest Religion and Science Society. It's popular in the last uh, number of years, as many of you may know, uh, with the advent of the so-called new atheists uh, to disparage anything except uh, so-called scientific reasoning uh, and to suggest that uh, religious uh, thought is all really just nonsense. Uh, we're going to hear tonight, I think, a perspective that suggests that um, it's not quite so simple and there's more to it than that. Earl's other interests... Uh, as uh, someone with long-standing roots in the community, uh, include uh, great activity in uh, Boy Scouts, uh, local historical societies, uh, his parish of uh, St. John the Baptist on Fairfield Avenue here in town, um, and service to the wider uh, Roman Catholic Church in the diocese uh, as director of the uh, Religious Education Institute of the diocese for a number of years. He continues to do consulting work uh, with various uh, hospitals and community agencies, uh, and has served uh, the Allen County Emergency Mobilization Team. He will come and speak to us now, uh, and then uh, there's a number of opportunities uh, tonight. Uh, he will flag those for us uh, of uh, the ability to interact and pose questions and offer some feedback. Uh, and so I will be uh, popping around with this microphone for those of you uh, so inclined to speak. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Earl Comfer. Uh, good evening, good people. That's a, a salutation used by Francis often that I'm starting to get used to, to using. It's spring. It's a time for transplanting in our gardens and in our yards. And transplanting, as my wife has discovered this spring, often involves the loss of some cherished plants to make way for some new growth or to split some of those that had gotten so tight that they need to be divided. I start with that metaphor because I want to forewarn you um, that some deeply rooted ideas you have may need splitting and relocating, perhaps, uh, because of paradigm shifts that have occurred in our culture. Our age, as Adam suggested, is troubled by the phenomenon that our theologies and our sciences often speak foreign languages to each other, if they bother to converse with each other at all. They use words and models differently. They speak often at each other from inside different mindsets or worldviews. Even worse, many spokesmen for the two worldviews harden their positions defensively, sometimes aggressively, engaging in a competition 
between science and religion. Think back to the last few years and what you've seen in the media regarding evolution versus creation. That argument's been going on for 70 years or better. The new atheism and the four horsemen that are sponsoring that new move. The controversy over intelligent design and whether it is a science and should be taught in our school curriculum as a science. A believing scientist today may feel that this gap is very personal. It may affect her spirituality. One who struggles with his faith may be scandalized into approaching faith as one fork in a road that will never again cross paths with the efforts or the contributions of science. More than one believing scientist has shared with me that when they put on their lab coat, they temporarily set aside their personal faith. Not on this campus, but on a couple others where several of us have, have made presentations along this line. And certainly more than one contemporary theologian has shared in writing that their discipline can lead to the truth without needing science. I find this situation tragic. But the final tragedy is that many pretend that there is no gap at all. There are only bad ideas and stubborn folks whose errors go untouched by the truth. More and more people see the gap between faith and reason as a chasm that will never be crossed. They do not think that their models and paradigms can ever integrate with or contribute to the paradigms of others. If that is so, then both paradigms are broken and they are incapable of bridging this gap. This has not always been so. The Copernican Revolution began some 600 years ago and may not be over. Early modern giants in science were as motivated by their vibrant faith as they were by their insatiable curiosity. <clears throat> the Franciscan friars at Greenwich were as deeply engaged in science there as they were in preaching at the royal court there. I see the, the current alienation between religion and science partly fueled by the media. They love the controversy. It makes news. It's been partly fueled by differences between scientific and theological methods. They don't always understand each other. It has been fueled by higher education's tendency towards specialization. And it has been partly fueled by using mutually exclusive paradigms for the mind-body problem, which is where we're going to look tonight. If, to borrow a metaphor of John Paul II, we are again to fly with both wings, the wings of faith and the wings of reason, it is important, I will argue, to find or create a new paradigm, one that can help us resolve critical issues in our day, one that can encourage us to move beyond mere tolerance of each other in science and religion, and perhaps one that can inspire us into some very serious productive dialogue. So my intention tonight is to move myself and you in this direction a bit. Consciousness offers, I believe, an opportunity for building a meaningful bridge between across this gap. I invite you to temporarily suspend belief in your own paradigm of consciousness for a few moments in hopes of finding a better one or parts of a better one. Consciousness has become an everyday term. We hear it on Oprah, on Dr. Phil, in rap music, in novels, in emergency rooms, and casual conversations. It's used in almost every academic discipline in some sense or other. We all know how to use the word, but it's certainly not the case that we can all hear what each other mean by it. We can examine consciousness with different agendas. And I'm not going to read these to you because you can read faster than I can speak. But there are many agendas that consciousness and our way of thinking about it will address. 
So my point is clearly uh, to be able to grasp what consciousness is could be a key factor to getting at some of these agendas. I hope tonight that we're all going to talk and I'm going to warm you up to this a little bit right now. I'm going to ask two questions. How many of you attended my lecture last December? Of those who did, are you the same person who attended last year? Or put another way, despite any or all of the changes that happened to you since, major or minor, dramatic or not, did you become someone different than the person who attended last year? Don't have to answer that out loud. And then the second question, am I the same person that you heard last year? Without warning you, what I just did was put you through an exercise in consciousness. I inspired you or tricked you into thinking. And my guess is, because of the way I posed the questions, I made you very conscious of what you were doing. The consciousness is not part of what you were thinking, but it is a quality that's added to the action that you perform very deliberately, very personally, very uniquely. There are, I would point out, two puzzles from a philosophical point of view in what we just did. The first is, it is an important puzzle about your consciousness and your personal identity. It is the first person perspective puzzle. You were thinking about something from your personal point of view. In thinking and answering, you were very conscious of thinking and answering. Whatever that individual conscious you is, I was asking if you remembered it being different than it was a year ago. This is what philosophers call the problem of personal identity. How do we explain that? The second puzzle about your consciousness regarded your shifting of awareness even if your answer was no as to whether I might be the same person as last year's speaker. Now your focus was not first person, it was third. You were conscious of something other than yourself that you were directing your attention to. I ask you to think and to answer in the third person perspective about something other than yourself, about which you had no internal self-consciousness. Philosophers call this the problem of other minds. These are not the same puzzle, although it's easy to think that they might be. And they cannot be resolved by the same methods, the same evidence, or the same arguments. This is a picture taken about eight years ago. in a lab by Michael Davidson, uh, west of the campus of University of Wisconsin in Madison. This is a Tibetan monk. Davidson is a psychiatrist, and over the last 20 years, nearly 20 years now, he has interviewed and monitored them. This monk is not wearing a hat or a wig that is a whole series of EEG sensors. So as the monk begins his meditation, they start recording. They have very large computers there, and they're recording all of the impulses, the flow of blood, and the flow of electronic movement through his brain. 
as he puts himself into a deeper level of consciousness, as he moves around in consciousness and comes out. One of the requirements for Davidson is that these monks that he is working with have to have had at least 10,000 hours of experience in meditation. He also has a number of clients who have adjustment difficulties with fear, phobias of getting on airplanes or high places or whatever. And what he's learning from the monks and monitoring third person, because what you and I see here is third person. We're not seeing ourselves, are we? And the electrodes are not seeing self either. They're seeing something that is outside of themselves. So all of the data that is being gathered is third person data from the outside. They will not capture what the monk is conscious of. They can only see the biophysical responses to whatever is going on in his consciousness. The mystery of consciousness from a third person perspective involves a number of problems. How can we describe it? What does it really do? How does it do what it does? Is consciousness only an individual thing, or can there be collective consciousness, as Jung suggests? What are the mechanisms? What are the biological mechanisms? Could we have evolved without it? Could it be an illusion <clears throat> Could consciousness not even be real? These are lesser problems, and their answers are more or less ordinary, and they are in the literature of the field. The really, really good problem, the one that has a lot of promise, has been called by David Chalmers the hard problem. Why was he creative when he thought that name up? It's at the very center of the mystery of consciousness, and it can, has been stated a number of different ways. How do subjective experiences arise out of objective brains? How on earth can an electrical firing of millions of tiny brain cells produce this, my private, subjective, conscious experience? How can some cells give rise to subjective experiences and some not? So how could physical stuff produce mental effects? Before we become distracted by the very large body of theories and experiments reported, let's refocus on consciousness in that first person perspective. And my reason for doing this is this approach to consciousness has been set aside and not bothered with for far too long, I think. It may not by itself answer the hard problem, but it is fertile with all sorts of suggestions for changing our paradigms so that we could perhaps make a contribution towards solving that problem. A few moments ago, I asked you two questions. Did you attend my lecture last year? And am I the same person who gave that lecture last year? No matter what your answer was, you began to think, to remember, to assess, to decide whether you would answer out loud or by raising your hand, you began to act mentally. And accompanying that mental work was an experience of you doing that mental work. You were performing in a first-person perspective. Now, what can we say about that experience that you had of being the one who is doing that work? Is it real? Is it a real experience of something real? So was the experience itself real? Was the content of it real? A famous philosopher from the actually born in 1596 and dies in 1650, René Descartes, a Swiss Frenchman, 
powerful mathematician, spent his life making a living by grinding lenses, is sometimes referred to as the first great modern philosopher. Some of us argue he was the last of the scholastics. In any case, he failed to notice that the two questions we just talked about were really separate questions. And in doing that, he committed one of the most horrendous philosophical mistakes in the modern period, a mistake that philosophy is still now only beginning to recover from. Let's pause and see how he answered them. Then we can move on and answer them for ourselves. And I think we're going to do that collectively because you're going to talk back in a bit. Descartes was overturning the problem of doubt. He wanted to get rid of doubt or find a solution to it. And he decided to not resist doubt, to not try to limit its damage. His creative insight was to let it run its course until it exhausted itself. So he doubted everything. If he could doubt it, he would suspend belief, put it on the shelf, and go on to the next thing. All that doubt would not be able to eliminate would then become, for Descartes, first principles. And with them, he could reconstruct an error-free body of knowledge, of truth claims, through rigorous and valid deduction. These are his words. And you probably will notice toward the end in this discourse in method, and I'll read just the last parts here. Sorry about that. He says, ooh, that's kind of hard to see. At about here, he says, but I soon noticed that while I was thus wished to think everything else false, it was necessarily true that I who thought so was something. Since this truth, I think, therefore I am, or exist, was so firm and assured that all the most extravagant suppositions of the skeptics were unable to shake it, I judged that I could safely accept it as the first principle of the philosophy I was seeking. That's the spot in the Discourse on Method, where in French, he did what in Latin we define as cogito ergo sum. If you know anything about Descartes, it's probably that phrase. What he is noticing is what we noticed, that there is an immediacy of this subjective agent of mental activity. We are immediately present to ourself as being the one who is doing the acting, thinking, deciding, judging, doubting. His cogito ergo sum is commonly taken as an argument, concluding to the existence of the self. This is a mistake, because that's not what he's doing. It clearly is not his intent. His claim is that he exists is an intuition, not a conclusion. It is a sort of self-evident truth, a first principle, a basis for further reasoning. That he does not see it as a conclusion is very clear in later reiterations of this essay and this same topic. Four years later, writing his new philosophy in Latin so that the theologians could read it, after revisiting the same steps in his methodic doubt, he says this. And again, I don't need to have you read everything. Thus, after having thought well on this matter, and after examining all things with care, I must finally conclude and maintain that this proposition, I am, I exist, is necessarily true every time that I pronounce it or conceive it in my mind. It's not a conclusion. It's an intuition. It's something that flows from the experience that he was doubting, and he realized the experience contradicted the possibility that he did not exist. And then he goes on to say something important that most readers never get to. It's the very next line. But I do not yet know sufficiently clearly what I am, I who am sure that I exist. 
I am therefore to speak precisely only a thinking thing, that is to say a mind, an understanding, or a reasoning being, which are terms whose meaning was previously unknown to me. And that's where he makes his mistake. Here he expresses the certainty of his existence as given by first personal experience, not by proof. Notice he does not call this mental agent a soul. He calls it a mind, a thinking being. Later, he concludes that he is also a physical being, that he exists in space and time. But unfortunately, lacking a way for these selves to causally interact, he concludes to a strong dualism of substance in his treatment of person. We'll come back to that. Now we can return to the two questions regarding that first person experience that we had with a little more precision. At least we know a couple of things not to do, some conclusions not to jump to. The first question, or the first variation on that question that I asked was, was it a real experience? When you were thinking, when you were noticing that you were thinking, was that real? Descartes says yes, and my guess is, I can't tell because I'm not in your minds, that you thought so when you were doing it, that you were not dreaming, you were actually experiencing, you were actually performing those. So there was some sort of an I or an ego, to use the Latin word, that is doing the mental or the physical act. And in addition to that, there is also an awareness of at least some quality relating to the seeing and the deciding and so on. Not all actions, mental or otherwise, are conscious to us in a first-person sense. In fact, some of our actions that are not conscious are certainly genuine. Your breathing, that's real, even if it's not something you are always conscious of. They might even be experienced by others from a third-person perspective. Others might notice that you're breathing even when you are not aware of it. A second question, which is not ontological, it's an epistemological question, is was it an experience of something real? And the answer simply is, and this is where Descartes makes his big mistake, we don't know for sure what it is that we just experienced. He jumps to the conclusion that it is a knowing self. We're not sure of that yet. And we want to avoid making that mistake by assuming something we don't have reasons for assuming yet. Put another way, we know the first person dimension of our mental act is genuine, it exists, we don't yet understand what's going on there. We don't yet know what it means with regard to our other beliefs and our knowledge. Philosophers for the last 150 years have called these first-person singular conscious qualities of experiences qualia. The singular is quale. As far as I can tell, no one but us philosophers use this word in a technical sense. We're talking about those aspects of your awareness when you are conscious of what you are doing. We see that they are intrinsic, consciously accessible. They are not representational. They do not necessarily have to have information about reality in them. And some examples. We have perceptual experiences of seeing red, of smelling skunk. You notice that you're smelling what is probably a real or an artificial skunk smell, the feeling of roughness on sandpaper. There are also some body sensations, an itch. In fact, that may make us very conscious after a while, although we might scratch without being conscious about it. 
felt emotions such as delight or fear, regret, grief, felt moods, you feel depressed, you feel sick, you feel bored. And there are other experiences. Understanding a sentence, noticing something missing from a list, suddenly remembering you forgot to turn off the tea kettle. Clearly, describing these non-representational aspects of of conscious experience would be a good first step towards explaining it. So let me ask, which means I'm going to come, or Adam is going to come around, and, and if you've got some insight, I hope you can share it, because then we can all gain from it. What do you notice or feel or think about your own consciousness from inside your own first-person perspective? What do you notice about being conscious and how that's different from not being conscious? Let me put it another way. How do you know that you're awake? What is it that you notice? I, I wasn't going to answer the second one. I was going to answer the first one. Um, I think when I'm conscious, really conscious of, of what I'm sensing, I feel like I have, um, in a sense, some control over what it is I perceive. Um, that I'm taking in information and um, that I can either accept that information or I can reject it. Um, I can think about it or I can choose not to think about it. Mm -hmm. And that comes with that general thing called awareness. I don't know if this is exactly what you're thinking, but when you ask the question, if you were the same person uh, last last time you spoke here, I started thinking, trying to become aware or think about that talk. And I noticed that I had to have a few clues. So as soon as someone said December, all of a sudden my consciousness went a little bit, oh, Feast of the Immaculate Conception, then it went a little further. So it was... I noticed that becoming conscious, you follow kind of stages. And if I had stopped to answer it right away, as soon as you asked it, I couldn't even remember the talk or what it was about, but dwelling on that little bit, it just led me down to a heightened awareness of what that talk was. And of course, I think you're the same person. Let me feed back something you didn't say and see if it rings true with you that the consciousness wasn't doing the thinking, but you were aware of the fact that you shifted strategies. It wasn't just that you could remember, you had to puzzle it out, you had to follow clues. You were aware of the fact that that you were changing from one kind of mental activity to another kind of mental activity, that you were shifting actions. You were thinking, puzzling, connecting, disconnecting, following clues. All of those are different kind of mental activities. But still there was one continuous consciousness that somehow was like an umbrella over all of those. I don't know if that rings true, but I heard something like that in, in what you said. And again, it's that, that's, that whatever this thing is that is conscious is not just purely passive. You were, you were doing some work there. Something was flowing from you into those 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 mental activities. I, I would I would agree with that, but I, I also think that consciousness has stages. You know, I couldn't I couldn't really become aware of that last talk until I started thinking from the clues. So I don't know. So maybe mm-hmm. thinking was a part of the because once you are conscious of something. Doesn't it call into a whole range of things or that kind of consciousness? I I don't mean to use consciousness only as awareness, but that's sort of one stage of it. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, in that case, to translate it into what bio, uh, neurobiologists would talk about, they would actually see shifting going on in the neurons, uh, the colors of, of you know, following an MRI or with, the, with EEGs, they would see that there was excitement going on in a different part of the brain. Um, but there's, there's a general aura of color that, that, that appears when you're awake rather than asleep. So the connectedness is one thing, and the degree of, of presence, the degree of awareness, is, is something else that they seem to measure as well. Any other reflections? Anything else you noticed? John? Yeah. When you said, uh, <clears throat> if I understood the uh, question correctly, you know, what do you sense when you think about consciousness? Or if I stop to think, what am I conscious about? When I, I just did that a few minutes ago when you asked that question, and the only thing I could come to is not so much content, although I had to right. place it into words, but just a certain heaviness. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, I really can't describe it beyond that. I mean, maybe almost a certain dread. I don't know if there's a psychological Is it something reason. like the metaphor we used, the light went on? Well, the, not really. It's the just light the, was not off? There was... It's just... Again, I, I become aware that I'm a body, that I'm liquid, okay? That I have a dry mouth right now. That I can touch my flesh and it feels warm that I have substance, that I'm solid, and there's just a certain downward pull. And I don't know what, if that's okay. purely subjective or what that is, or maybe I'm just crazy. I don't know, but I just, I mean, yep. that's the only way I know how to answer the question. When you say consciousness, well, this is what I'm feeling when I stop to think about right. what I'm feeling in the, most, in, right. in the most basic sense. That is, I think, what most folks are talking about. Okay. Now that Dr. Paquette brings that up, that brings up something else that, like maybe not a heaviness in my case, but I call it like my brain's cooking. Like I feel like if I could put a picture to it and I'm being conscious of, you know, work or whatever, my brain, the gears are clicking in my brain and there's like, I can almost feel my brain working. You know, like I, it's not like I'm just kind of, I don't know if it's awareness, but then when you first asked the question, I couldn't really answer this question per se, but I, walked backwards to, mm -hmm. in my mind, to the first question of, um, or the second question of, are you the same person this year than you were last year? And I remember in my mind thinking, first of the experiences that happened, but I was convinced within my own thinking that I'm not limited to those experiences. There has to be something between last year and this year that keeps me me or else I'm constantly in flux. And that particular thought, I don't know if that helps anything, but just the, the notion of something essential. So. And I think we'll see in a few minutes that does tie into something I'm going to bring up later. I think as I was listening, like thinking about this question, I realized that two things were going on for me since I've had you in so many classes. I was both thinking about the question in the present, like the present, I guess I was looking at it in both data and perception, and there's kind of a neat activity that occurs between those two. And I was thinking about the data of the present, like looking around at the walls and at speakers and at people listening to one another, but then I was also think I was also pulling on like past memories or ideas from other lectures and trying to think of other questions you'd ask so I wouldn't sound completely ignorant of the topic. And so I realized that there's both past data and present data. And I mean, we can all do that. Like I can touch John's skin and think that he's cold. So some of that has to do with the way my first person is going to synthesize that information into a perception. And I think consciousness is kind of present. It's not even just an awareness, but it's also, it, it needs to be in order for the activity to occur. There was just one thing came to me, and that was the, uh, I felt a delight, uh, a glee uh, in the first question. Are you the same person you were uh, months ago or mm -hmm. whatever you are? There, there was just a sense of um, delight in thinking about and in, in, in awareness of that, <laughs> of, of that passage. Mm -hmm. So it has... The experience itself has a quality. Correct. Yeah. 
all of you have been using the word I a lot as you were talking about that. Very, very aware of the fact that what you're experiencing is absolutely unique, ineffable. You really know that no one else can sit behind your eyeballs and experience what you're experiencing as you're experiencing it. And at the same time that we are all islands, none of us, unless we do some very, very severe detailed communication, don't even have a clue of what's going on behind the eyeballs of anybody else. That's the first person perspective. Third person, we are noticing what our senses can take in and process, and we're not paying attention to that, that, that centeredness that we feel in, in this kind of experience. There are a couple of other questions there. Um, what kinds of properties can that quality have and must they have? Uh, and these are questions that, I, that I'm constantly asking my science acquaintances. You probably have seen this before. Um, what is it? Pardon? It's a duck and a rabbit. Is it a duck and a rabbit at the same time? Can you... F okay. Do you notice yourself flipping back and forth? And Sister Anita mentioned that she felt that qualies had a kind of control thing. Can you freeze one of them? It's an interesting experiment to have electrodes on when that happens uh, because it excites different parts of the brain. There's blood flow changes rather dramatically in MRIs. This is an example of one of those qualities or characteristics that we are conscious of. It's the awareness that we can be confused, not sure what it is, and that that awareness can change from one moment to the next, like, oh, it's a duck. Oh, wait, it's a rabbit. No, I can make it a duck. I can find the rabbit. Uh, the, my best experience of this is going to the mall a number of times. I haven't seen it recently where there's a painting with all kinds of little, um, little pieces of paint, and people are standing there and looking at it, and someone goes, ah, there it is, it's a boat. And we all go, what? Until we see it. Uh, that the, the shift of the quality, whether it's excitement or confusion, sadness or joy, whatever it might be, is one of those features of, of a quality. I've been working on this for a while, and I have put a list together. I would not have expected you to name all of these things, but I noticed that you named six of them, six qualities that I've noticed that may be qualities of attentiveness or of experience. Uh, and my, my project for the next couple of years, if it takes me that long, is to get to different kinds of scientists and different kinds of meanings and say, talk to this philosopher and tell me if I'm barking up a wrong tree. Is there third world, is there third person data, is there third person knowledge that corresponds with these first person reflections, these first person experiences? Notice the first of those, the immediacy of it, that you are present to it. It is almost as if your awareness is frozen in a continual flowing present. In fact, some people would say consciousness flows from one thing that I'm doing to another thing. First reactions I'm getting from scientists is, no, that doesn't happen. There is no continuity, that it is always present that there is no shifting, that what I'm doing is remembering, not experiencing past. I'm remembering it and then can kind of experience it, that that is a step kind of basis. A good proof for this that they use is called change blindness. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but you'll have someone flipping with, with, with cameras or something, uh, a picture that looks like it keeps reoccurring and they keep saying, it's two different pictures. Keep looking at it, and then something very obvious shows up that your mind just filters out at a lower level of perception, and that is that there's a huge bar in there, or there's an airplane flying past the window or, or something, and you don't see it. 
And what's embarrassing is when you're sitting there in a group and you're staring at it and a couple of people go, oh, and then they start laughing. Like, how could I have missed something so obvious? Uh, and that's because it, the attention, the focus is so short in time that you don't notice it. Another example of that in the old movies is you look at the stagecoach and the wheels are going the other way. It's the same kind of phenomenon. That's happening in here. It's not happening in your eye. Time referenced. Some would argue that there is some sort of awareness of deja vu, that this has ha I've had this before, uh, with, with that, that puts you into a time reference. Some would argue there's no continuity objectively that can be measured third person there. If it is there, it's only there in first person. The subjectivity, I think, is very evident. We know that whatever I'm thinking, no one else can tell unless I tell them. That this experience is uniquely me, that I can never get inside your head and see and experience that presence, that awareness of the experience from the way you do it. And the ineffability follows from this. I, we can talk about it to a point. Uh, but what I mean by blue, when I'm aware of blue, I'm not sure that I can ever communicate that to anyone else. Now I know that I'm blue-green colorblind, so I suspect that my blue is like nobody else's, at least not the general population's. There is certainly, as Father John mentioned, an affective context. There is a kind of emotionality. Sometimes it's just sad. Whatever is going on uh, is, is something that I'm aware in a kind of depressed way or a joyful way or a surprised way. There are lots of different emotional qualities that come and go. Whether we can control them is an interesting question. It certainly is an awareness that has a focus that's objective. So I get a smell, a present tense smell, and I smell skunk. And then I go looking for the skunk, or I check with other people, do you smell skunk too? Or am I just imagining that? Because the content is not necessarily self-evidently true, but it certainly seems to be that I'm aware of myself being related by my actions, by my mental behaviors with other kinds of things. And the, the old problem of idealism, how do I know that it's really out there? That awareness certainly also seems to have a kind of a unifying effect. And we know this from people who have had damage. Uh, a common effect with stroke is that, it's fairly common, it's called the, the hemifield effect, uh, that, that a person might have a stroke in one hemisphere of the brain and virtually, in a conscious way, not be able to see half of the world. And I've talked to a, a patient in a hospital with that effect. They just don't see it. That half of the world just is gone. And it's dangerous because as they go moving around, they bump into things or things that are coming to them, they do not see in a conscious way. And what's most interesting about the hemifield effect is it only affects conscious awareness they still flinch. So unconsciously, there is, there is a sensing of something, and not only the sensing, but the interpreting of it as being dangerous, as moving fast toward me, causing a, a duck reflex, not the kind of duck we saw a while ago, but it doesn't enter consciousness. One experimenter that I talked to said, well, what I, one of the things I do in the experiment with these folks is I'll have them look and they, they see a whole panorama of things and they can only describe as if they only had one eye covered, but both eyes are open, they can only see one half because the other part of their brain in the conscious point is not functioning. And then he'll say, I can't tell you what's over there. It's, it's, it's blank, it's like a big blind spot. It's just all blank. And he'll say, guess. Guess what's there. And 95% of the time, they guess correctly. So there is unconscious knowledge going on. There is unconscious mental activity going on uh, that never registers as being something that, that we are aware of. 
And it's not that there's a different hemisphere, it's just that level of awareness. Something physical is different in the brain. And they, they can isolate where the, the degree of color in the MRIs and the other things are, are different. Uh, they can locate the part of the, the, the brains where, where the damage, where the blockage, the artery break was, and that sort of thing. And, and eventually the neurons will grow back and, the, and they can regain consciousness in that full spectrum again. But it's interesting that consciousness has something to do with that unifying, that there's a continual reshuffling at an unconscious level, but the consciousness sees it as one sees it as one field of, of experience. It certainly is, by all evidence, a, and this is an important feature of qualia, that it's a high level process, that the lower level processes of consciousness don't rely on it, but it relies on them. So if, they, if, the, if, if you're colorblind, you're never gonna be conscious of a color you cannot visually see. So it's, it's, it's a, it certainly is an emergent kind of higher level neurological process, which suggests that consciousness is locatable. To the extent that those mental acts are happening, they're happening in locales. And that one of the big arguments among neurobiologists and neuroscientists um, these days is whether it is individual pathways of neurons or whether it's field that it's a whole set of them interacting with each other. So it's not that an impulse goes from, from your, your, your elbow, that's one neuron, by the way, that goes all the way to your brain. It's one cell that does that connection. So when you bump it, you get this pain. It's not transmitted over a chain of them, but then once it gets there, it becomes part of a mesh or a field rather than a single pathway that you could follow with a pencil. One of the most interesting to me is the business of attention level. We certainly are, and this is something I wrote on uh, 25 years ago, um, in, in, in terms of tacit knowledge and virtual knowledge in, in Michael Polanyi, that we can ride a bicycle better if we stop paying attention to what we're doing and just make it a habit so that when we're first learning, we're trying to balance and we're trying to pedal and we're trying to guide. And after a while, once we get it all put together, we can probably do it. As long as we're focused on where we want to go or we're focusing on going fast, that there is some sort of integration that is going on within the body. I had a good friend years ago who was state uh, tennis champion when he was 16. And his coach, when he was eight, had him, before he got out of bed, go through the three basic strokes five times each without moving a muscle, just to think through what his arm and hand and elbow and everything was doing. Then to get out of bed, not pick up a racket yet, and physically go through the motion five times and then pick up a racket. And what he was telling him was, and it's interesting because neurology is now confirming this, he was teaching his arm how to remember where to be. That what he was doing was the whole structure of, of neurological networks was starting to function without having to go to the centers where there's awareness so that it would become automatic. In philosophy, we call that being a zombie. That's a technical term in philosophy now. To actually function without awareness. So computers think, but they're zombies because they don't show any evidence yet that they have awareness of their thinking. It's not that they're programmed and we're not because we're programmed. Those of us who are involved in teaching are brainwashing all the time, right? We're programming people to use words correctly. So we're programmed too, but the difference is when we're acting, when our students are acting, they're doing it consciously. So it's not just a matter of unplugging us. And it's that attention level that is really interesting. If you have mental activity going on and there is no awareness, philosophically we call that being a zombie. And you can be a partial zombie. The hemifield example that I gave you, in one hemisphere of the brain, that hemisphere is continuing to operate without any awareness going on. 
so it can still function. It can still identify and guess well what's over here that's out of my awareness zone. It's, it's an interesting physiological series of phenomena. Not only is it attentive, but those of us who do ethics, it's also important to notice that it is intentional. There is intentionality going on that I can actually make somehow in that, in that condition, in that quality of being conscious, lies the, the root of what we mean by intention. That we can't intend when we're unconscious. That's called virtual intention in ethics for a good reason, because we can't change it there. It has to be brought to this level. An interesting feature of that is a process, and I don't have a good picture of this. It's called transcranial magnetic stimulation. I did observe a case of this in, in Madison, Wisconsin last summer. Uh, essentially what they are doing in the lab is they're, they're putting a magnet, electronically driven magnet over a person's head, and they're centering it at a particular part through the cranium, sending elect electronic currents through the bone into that part of the brain, stimulating the neurons there. And the experiment that I observed was an experiment where they could use electrical magnetic stimulation to overexcite an area of the brain. It doesn't cause any damage, as far as they can tell. And the instruction is the, the guinea pig, who happened to be a graduate student there, was the instruction was count to 20. So the person counted one, two, three, four, five, and then the guy threw the switch. Six, seven, he would actually block the counting mechanism, count that area of awareness, and the reaction of the, of the, of the student was amazing. What happened? was very aware of the fact that the signals, that the, the, the direction, my intention is to count one, two, three, four. I've got that sequence in mind, and I'm going to make my tongue, I'm going to make those words come out. And the words didn't come out. And nothing else changed that they could feel, that they could experience, except that there was something blocking it, and the words just would not come out. It's a common phenomenon with people who have stroke. And what they're doing is they're isolating where in the brain that is happening. Or is it where in the mind that's happening? Let's test to see if what we're talking about makes sense. Some of you have been there. This is the world of Warcraft. It's the only picture I've... And what you do in the world of Warcraft is you go into a multiplayer game. There may be hundreds or thousands of people around the world connected together on the internet on this virtual island in cyberspace, and you bring your own character there. You can also do this in uh, a, a number of, of other places. Uh, one that's kind of interesting is Second Life. I don't know if you ever go on the internet, try it sometime, and Google Second Life and go there. It is a whole world in which people live through what we call avatars. Avatar not in the religious sense, but in the modern adaptation of that. In some sense, there is a connection with the, with the Hindu avatar notion. But I create this being that has, digitally, a body, uh, and I create a personality, uh, what's interesting in the World of Warcraft, one of the uh, uh, analyses that I noticed was even though most of the time it's men who are playing, like the puppeteer behind the avatar, but when women have avatars, over half the time they create a male avatar. So when they're going to go fighting or, or, or running a business or whatever, they make it a male personality that they're operating through and never tell anybody that. Um, so you can change personality, you can make your dream self appear on the screen, uh, or you could role play the dark side of yourself or any kind of self. What's interesting about this notion of avatar is my question of a person who is playing there, or in sim world, or in second life, or in any of these virtual worlds, there's an interesting phenomenon there. Where is the I in that? 
So as I'm sitting there playing the game, and I've got this character, and I'm developing, uh, I'm doing exercises so he builds up strength. I can do all of those things. In, in next, next uh, Second Life, I can actually create a farm. I can buy some land and grow things and set up communications and knit furniture. Uh, in fact, there are people who live in these worlds you would think of them as fantasy, but they're not really fantasy, pure and simple, because they do have causal effects in this life. There are people who go there and earn a living. There are a group of, of Chinese folks who work 40 hours a week and they make $150,000 a year real cash. They go in and develop characters and then they sell them on eBay to lawyers and others who don't want to spend five months solid creating a character, they buy a character already made and take it in and go hunting or fighting or whatever they want to do. People can make a living there. There are professors at Notre Dame who teach in there. You can get a degree from the University of Notre Dame and take all of your courses with your character going into a classroom, setting down, doing lab experiments. It's all in virtual world and you're controlling it from your side of the, of the keyboard. Now, we have talked about experience and some of those experiences being conscious, right? When I'm in second world in a classroom and I'm hearing someone lecture and I'm taking notes and there's going to be a test, I can be present in a first person way maybe being scared or anxious about a test coming up. I can have the same kinds of responses in virtual world that I have in what we call this world. My curiosity is, where are they different? And this is where a lot of psychologists are going because some people like to live in that world and only come back when they have to. In fact, I think it was in Korea. There was a country just recently that that has decided within the last two or three days uh, that multiplayer games have to end at midnight until five o'clock. They're gonna shut them off. They're gonna pull the plug on them because too many people are spending too much time there and not going to work or going to work very tired because they're staying up at night. I'm thinking it was, it was one of the Koreas. Watch for it in the paper, it's, it's there. So there, there are gonna be psychological effects in this world because you're there. People can go crazy there. You can earn a living there. You could live most of your life there. I could go study SCOTUS there. Except we'd have to get him in there somehow. So my questions are, are those experiences in these multiplayer contexts, are they first person experiences? My guess is they probably feel exactly like what you reported feeling a while ago when you were just reflecting on your first person experience of asking the question. Are the avatars themselves zombies? They seem to fit that philosophical description that they are entities that are carrying out mental actions because I can tell them to design a plan, right? I can tell a computer to actually program another computer, right? So there seems to be some sort of mental activities that those avatars can be designed or created to do, but they still are missing that awareness, I think. And we who are the people who are running those avatars, are we different when we're running our avatar than when we're, we're, we're lecturing here? So if I would go to Notre Dame and conduct one of their classes for them in Second Life, would I be the same person? Just a slight environmental difference. A lot of people say, well, that's fantasy world. It's really no different. It's simply an electronic extension or a, a technological extension of this world. So I put on binoculars and I can see at a greater distance. So I can go into a virtual world and, and see and do things that maybe I cannot do here. I could go into a lab and perform surgery until I get it right, rather than practicing on real live human beings. But, but I would still be learning in this life, perhaps. We have a question back there, Adam. So I'm wondering if we can experience qualia in, in virtual reality, and we're probably gonna need to have some guinea pigs who wanna spend some time in Second Life or in World of Warcock 
um, situations and, and go there. Yes. I, I guess I thought it was kind of interesting that you phrased it perfect, like you phrased it as to run your avatar. And I've, like, I've, it wasn't World of Warcraft, but it was like Neopets, if anyone's ever been there. But I guess I viewed it as me being the person, not running. It wasn't a ghost in a machine theory. I was the avatar. Yep. But I guess that's also, I, I guess I make a distinction too between personness and humanness. And I feel like humanness, like we get really attached to this body and this physicality and this reality. When in some ways, like if you've spent hours on one of those websites, it's just like it may be a digital form. Like you talked about the digital form of a body. Like you create your digital form and then you're just running it. And in some ways, I think that the digital form of body action, like they still walk, they go around worlds, they get educations. Like I guess I just view it as a different sort of body because I also believe in the notion of like when we go to heaven, we get a new body, but I don't, I still see myself as mm -hmm. Caitlin in heaven. And so there's a different physical form there. Why can't there be different physical forms here? So I guess that's one of my, that's my take, I guess, on this world. I don't, I wouldn't see them as zombies necessarily. I would see them as real persons and, maybe, and an extension of self just as me coming to college may be different from my persona in high school or at work, but it's still part of myself and part of my personness. Let me, let me give you an example. If, if you set your avatar to work there, one of the things you can do is work in a gold mine and dig up virtual gold and then go cash it in for real dollars. Um, and you can do that while you're sleeping. You can, because, you know, the avatar never gets tired. You can just, you just keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over again and creating virtual ore. Um, in that case, he would be a zombie. In the case where I'm using and operating in a battle or something, or I'm milking my cow very consciously, then my consciousness would be the consciousness of the avatar. Is that what I hear you saying? Um, well, I mean, I know that they like go on and carry on some actions outside of that, but I guess I would just see that. I guess that's kind of hard to explain because on like on the place that I was at, they didn't do anything until I got back to it. Okay. So, um, but there are some games where where that does take place. Um, okay. But at least there are some some parallels. Is what what I hear you getting at. I guess there's also a structure of power and hierarchy still in those games okay. too that really translates to society here. There's That's a good, true. there's an evil, there's being ashamed, you feel loved, ashamed, hurt, scorned, you can die. <laughs> mm -hmm. And people, like some people who get really into it actually experience like a sort of death, part of a, a, a death of like part of them. Oh yeah, if, if your character gets killed in the battle, you're dead and you could mourn yourself. Yeah. People are making money off of this stuff. Then there's at least the possibility they could also lose money. Oh yeah. So when does the IRS get involved in this? I mean, is there so, deductible? Is it so, so far they don't have a legal way of doing it. So I could make money at this and not have to pay a dime in taxes. That's right. Okay. I've walked in it. I've played games where you walk into, say, a village, a large, bustling city, and people are, they have their avatar sitting cross legged by the side of the road, and they have a big running message saying, I've earned 1,000, you know, we'll call them game bucks. I don't know what they're called, you know. Game bucks. I will. Um, I have a PayPal account that is verifiable and bona fide, and I have people that will tell you that it's good. And if you don't want to work hard and earn five thousand game bucks, I can sell them to you for ten bucks American, or you know whatever. For me, yes. <laughs> Well, all this is new to me, 
And I have a computer at home, but my question is, who's got the time for this? I mean, oh, that's, that's certainly an I issue. I mean, it's like, I have enough going on in my own world here, that's right. let alone go off into what I consider kind of like another world, maybe. And, and this is a, an interesting sociological problem because there are some people who are starting to live in that society. Yeah, and what's the consequence of that mentally and um, you know, psychologically, you know, that could cause a whole new diagnosis. Oh yeah. For psychiatrists, because you know, if they start having emotional problems, you know, in what I'm going to yeah. call the real world, right. Right. you know, and they're going to sit and go to the psychiatrist, well, go to their family physician, and then go. To, they say, well, you need to see a psychiatrist. So you go to the psychiatrist. The psychiatrist says, and you know, and it comes from that mode, from the computer, and that being an avatar. Won't that create a whole new diagnosis and a whole new? A whole, uh, new, a whole new specialty in psychiatry. Right, yeah. That'll cost more yeah. money, probably. Well, but I, I just wonder, I just don't have the time now to hardly do what I've got to do, let alone. And it's, it's not that everybody's going to do it. My interest is, my interest is you know, how is that different than, than this world where we, we talk about physical flesh? So is mind something that could be out of body? And it, it offers some intriguing possible thoughts that way. Uh, one of the things that, that triggered this, this line was, I was reading several months ago, uh, about how in the second and third century, many Christians being confronted by the Stoics, who they had adopted pretty much their philosophy, uh, discovered that the Stoics did not believe in afterlife. So their description of the world, their description of truth, their description of physics and so on, was not going to compute into what happens to us after we die. What, what does resurrection look like? What will it feel like? And that's when they turned to the Neoplatonist uh, who had another world. And the other world was a world that was bodiless. And so in, in the third century, in much of the discussion of resurrection, it is, it is the resurrection of the ego, of the self. They didn't use this language because that language was not philosophically developed then. Uh, but it had to be a world without the physical world. And that was the notion of the immortal soul that dates back into the 7th century BC Greek world that was not part of the Jewish and early Christian world. But they, they, they came up with that notion then of soul and later person to try to, to cover this, what do I do after I die? After I die, and, my, and because the Greek notion was that when you died, just your mind went on. Your mind was, was immaterial, could not corrupt, was not in space and time. It could float around, and they were not thinking of ghosts. They were thinking of some just pure disembodied minds floating around. And, and they were not satisfied that that was a pleasant thought. Um, but, but for Christians, this became an intriguing idea, then that mind could contemplate God. And we see the theologies of the third and fourth centuries starting to develop that kind of language. But it's almost as if it's a disembodied resurrection. And then later, the, the emphasis on the body side comes back in. So we had the dualism of the Neoplatonists that were going to make that, that fly. But the question was, what happens when all of this shuts down? Can I think? Can I talk? Can I see people? I mean, the same questions I hear students answering a lot. Once we're dead and rise, what can we imagine for that? And, and, and theologians have, have had to go to the philosophical systems that were available to them to find a language, to find a paradigm that would explain that. So, it, and this is where I think we may have a paradigm shift. As, as Caitlin suggested a moment ago, this is suggested to her that maybe afterlife does make some sense without this organic biological body. I can still be a person, I can still be functioning, I can still be consciously acting in a different kind of body, that I don't have to get this one back, which is, which is very true to, to our Christian heritage. So the, the, I, in my, my reason for going there is that looks like a place where we can get theologians and biochemists talking to each other. What's the afterlife going to be like when we have this mental behavior and we don't have the same body that we have now? What, and how can that work? If it looks like mind is very dependent on body, 
because when we cause damage, we, we have people who have the experience of pain in an arm that has been amputated. How can that happen? How do we explain that, that they still feel that pain? And the arm is long gone, right? Uh, so we've got a lot of phenomena there that, that, that stymie the scientist. And the theologian with our own concepts, I think, can come to the table and say, you know, we have some alternative models here that we, we could explore. And I think there's, there's a possibility of that here. But, but I think you're right. On, on, the, on the front end of this, it looks like, who would ever want to do that? Because it looks like we're busy enough in this world. But there are a lot of people who don't mind exploring and who find themselves contented in, in that world. Yeah, I actually, uh, the cable channel MTV did a documentary mm. about it. They have a series called True Life, and they did somebody like I game or something like that, and they showed a, a lady that did World of Warcraft, and she really did, they just shift their priorities to mm -hmm. that alter ego almost, rather than their their real life, the life that they're physically in, they shift it to that one. But then there was a, another, a lady that she did the second life thing, and she was a musician, but she, in real life, she had stage fright and would not perform out in public. But mm. in the second life character, she was, like, having concerts, and she had, like, fans, and she would give concerts out there, and she's like, I'm really popular in my second life. But she couldn't make that translate into her... The, the physical reality that she was in. So it, it leads me to that question, are avatars persons different from our real persons or merely extensions of them? So is the person that she had on Second Life, is that like the real person that she's, she's meant to be or, or the real person that she is and there's something in her physical life that, or in her real life that blocks her from that? Or is she like extending outward of herself into this reality and becoming something because she's able to put up this, this mm -hmm. shield or this mm -hmm. wall or whatever where she's not actually present to people, that that's just, right. a, it's just an extension of herself, or is it her, which one her, would be her real person? That's a question I have to ask a psychologist because I don't know how to crack that egg. Yeah. What was I going to say? <laughs> I lost it. Oh, um, I think that... Uh, when you said that there was a common ground between the notion of an afterlife or second life or a different body, a body that is not physical, I think that's always been somewhat existent. That I mean, mm -hmm. it's I mean, even in Scripture, there's that there's a common ground where Jesus, who resurrected, was a body like ours, but not exactly like ours. And so, you know, origin's not too popular. But he spoke of a spiritual right. body, right. a body that is a body, but not like our body. And so how then do you, would you think that we could start to recover, I don't, I don't want to say, uh, less, maybe less terrestrial notions of a body, less, you know, I, I don't know if that's the right word, but, you know, not so meaty, let's just say that, less meaty notions of a body. Yeah, I, my, my first reaction is not to get too literal and to and, and, and the, the discussion or the, or the issue, but, but look at a number of different paradigms here that might have some fruitful possibilities and, and, and to keep putting them on the table. Uh, to, to eliminate all of the others, I think, might be a mistake. And I think we've made that mistake often enough in the past in philosophy and in science and until we get open enough to realize that phlogiston doesn't exist. I mean, it, it, it solved a problem, it answered a question, but, but it's not really out there. And then that led to the discovery of oxygen. I mean, we, we've had paradigms that have not worked, and we found out later we just had to throw them away. But to solve a certain problem, a particular model, a particular way of thinking about things, and using our language and our imaginations a little differently sometimes do solve new problems. And, and I, I, think, I think science has some experience in doing that. I think theology can, can, can freshen and, and enrich the tradition by looking at alternate translations, alternate interpretations, and so on. But I think there are core values that we can still bring forward that the scientist is looking for, too. Well, does the fear, does the fear reside in the language or the context? 
I think the gap is because of the language. We, 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 don't, we don't really listen to each other. We don't, as, as soon as you use the word soul in a laboratory, they go, what are you talking about? I can't see one. So the methodology says it does not compute, and, and that's when the chasm appears. Let me, let me move a little quickly to, toward an end here. I'm going to skip some things because I don't want to keep you here un, until morning. Um, as long as you're having fun. I was going to add while you think that there was a question earlier about like time, who has time to do it. And I think it's just a difference of perception too because I think this is the nightmare that they have like this reality that we think of as reality is just the nightmare they have to visit for a couple hours every day to like shower and do all those other things and that's the reality for so many people in the avatar world the priorities are there their to-do list are there their family is there their friends are there all the relationships and nurturing they feel are there so they view it as when do i have time to go visit that physical world that i have to go shower and eat in not when do mm -hmm. i have time to go visit this fantasy of virtual reality and i think that's just a difference of perception once you get kind of into that reality and i think part of the concern was you know people can get lost there and not come back um, and and some of the social or psychological problems that might create that might break up marriages for instance uh, let's look at a couple of things here as, as, as I move on, because there are a couple more things I want to get to and, and close out still within, w within an hour and a half, which is longer than I planned on talking. But I'm happy that this has been a conversation, because you gave me some, uh, s some slightly different angles of coming at some of this. From the, these reflections that we've been doing, first of all, analyzing and then looking at a kind of a novel way of thinking, uh, getting you out of your normal um, way of, of responding to, to lectures and so on with the avatar thing. Um, wh what can we say? I, th I think philosophically we can conclude to a couple of things. From these reflections, and primarily focused from a first-person perspective, which I, I think is not done enough, I propose that we can claim that a meaningful of account of a consciousness would need to include two things. So when I'm talking to scientists who are doing all the EEG stuff and finding out that there is a kind of a correspondence between this thought or this experience and, and this stuff that's going on in the brain, that I can say, okay, that's all good and fine, but we also need to keep in the tape, on the table an account of self, an account of that experience that we have of being an agent of mental and physical activity. And, and these qualia there have still not been explained, that the scientist in the lab cannot point to something and say, that's the qualia. They can say, this is going on when the qualia are experienced, but I still have not tapped into you having that experience. And I think it might be fruitful to further study the proposed characteristics of these qualia from a third person perspective to see if what I'm analyzing out of it, what we notice in our first person experiences, can a scientist point to anything that is a corresponding uh, correlation there? For theologians and scientists to engage in this study together, I think would enrich the understanding of both groups. It would also provide a laboratory for mutually discerning strengths and weaknesses of our disciplines. And to come back to the, the gap, I, I think part of the gap is that we have assumed since the time of Descartes, perhaps earlier, that there's only two worldviews that we can operate out of. That one of those is dualism, one of those is materialism. And materialism, I think, is much more sophisticated than I used to think of it. Uh, behaviorism is certainly a form of it, and, and so on. All of the materialisms involved that everything can be explained in terms of tangery, sensible data, that we can track it back, we can organize it, no matter how sophisticated and intense it gets, it's, everything still obeys the laws of physics, everything can be derived from the laws of physics, predictions, and so on, in various forms. Both physicalism, which we see in the physical sciences, functionalism very much in the, in the neurological sciences, 
and a kind of strong artificial intelligence view, which is still a material view. On the other side, we have dualisms, which come in two flavors. One is a dualism of substances, that it's things that are either mental or physical. If I can use the word mental to mean spiritual things, like this consciousness that we have. And then there are others, and I, th and I find this a more refreshing, a more fertile kind of dualism, but still a dualism, uh, that, it, that involves a dualism of properties. And a couple of, of theories that I have come across will, will maybe help us to, to see these differences. Basically, all the theories I think that have promise in terms of new paradigms from a philosophical point of view say both of those positions are flawed. They're true to a point, but there's stuff they cannot account for. Dualism cannot account for how does the soul interact with the body? How does something that's purely spiritual produce a non-spiritual effect or vice versa? How can my sensory apparatus produce an idea which is not physical? And that's the, that's the major problem that all of the dualisms have. On the other hand, with materialisms, how can you get something spiritual out of something that started out being just physical? So it looks like both of them are at an impasse. Operationally, they, they can't get all of the stuff they want to account for done. So it seems to me like we need a third. Rather than the two horns of the dilemma, to avoid and jump between the two horns. And I have stumbled onto three different perspectives, three different fairly cogent theories that I need to really work, work through the ringer that promise to answer the hard, the hard problem. One of these is a philosopher by the name of John Searle. I first stumbled on him in my first dissertation where I was working in philosophy of language. He's a biological naturalist. And he says he's waiting for the neurologist to work out the details, but that mind is more than brain, uh, and it's certainly a higher level emergent property of the physical brain, but it's able to do other things because of the level of complexity. Philip Clayton, who is a Quaker theologian at Claremont, has what he calls an emergent monism, uh, and that is the notion that the sophistication, when it reaches a certain level of, of complexity, produces a new phenomenon that is always retraceable back to its component parts. A classic example of emergentism is at some point in the history of, of the universe, at a purely physical level, there was oxygen and there was hydrogen. And when you got a, a uh, the correct sophistication and complexity of environment, it produced water. But the properties of water are not the same as the properties of hydrogen and oxygen. Both of them are flammable. Water is not. And all of the components of water are hydrogen and oxygen. So how can the whole not have the properties of its component parts? And emergentism goes back to a Greek idea that we find in Aristotle, that the whole is always greater than the sum of the parts. A dualist says what is greater comes from outside. An emergent monist says it comes from inside. That this evolution, and it's using an evolutionary kind of notion, you get enough complexity and you have enough sophistication, now the organization can take on new properties. More locally, we had a college and we grew into a university. And part of it was the complexity of the ingredients, size, numbers, programs, numbers of students, numbers of faculty, and, and it grows. Are we still a college? Yeah, there are still the fundamental notions and operations, but we are not performing at just a college level any longer. And the third person you know probably very well, you may not know him by this name, Karol Wojtyla, uh, a Polish cleric uh, in the 1970s uh, got a degree in philosophy, studied under a student of Husserl's. And as he tells us in his book, The Acting Person, uh, he set out as his agenda to 
to bring together traditional philosophy in, in the schoolmen together with the phenomenology in Edmund Husserl and his, and his thinkers, and he did. And he has put together a new philosophy of man called The Acting Person, which is the 10th volume in the Analectica Husserlania, uh, the only pope who has ever published in that series of journals. Uh, his is the 10th volume of what are now 96 volumes, and still, still in print. If you want to buy a fresh new copy, you're going to have to pay about $400 for uh, He is very respected as a philosopher long before he went to Rome to study theology. And what has been fascinating to me over all of the years that John Paul II reigned as pope, when I read his encyclicals, I see the philosopher in them. He was a philosopher long before he was a theologian, and his theology is built out of using philosophy in a different way. He was not a traditional Thomist. He was a Thomist a la Husserl. He put the two together in a very, very creative way. His paradigm is that we are the person we are, the ego or self that has these experiences is always an acting person. There is nothing static. What emerges is the activity. And that's when we become a person. And he analyzes in his acting person all of the things that have to be there in place before we become a person and grow in our spiritual ways as well as in our mental ways. Uh, it's, it is not a static view of man. Um, and another one of the, the, the features of John Paul II is he was the first pope to publicly at a conference say evolution is a fact. And we need to incorporate that with, with our thinking. And he himself had already done so, if you go back and look at the book that he wrote in 1978. It's, it's an amazing book. We've got one copy in the library, so you may have to stand in line to get, to get some use of it. But that paradigm, together with the paradigm that I see in Clayton and in Searle, uh, at least offers some opportunities of getting scientists to read something that will make some sense to them, that offer them some models for putting some of this together. I'm not going to walk through each of those separately for you. Um, if you want copies of this, send me an email and I'll gladly pass on what, what I've dug up here, but I don't want to keep you too much into the dark. If, if coming at this from a first-person point of view has added some, some new information to what has become a stale war between the neurologists who are saying, ah, the mind is nothing more than the brain, um, if we want to, to crack that egg, I think the kind of reflection that we have done tonight can be done by scientists. I think they can catch an image of that and then go, oh, now when I go back to the lab, I can think of myself as having qualia, as that my activity will have a property, not another substance, not another faculty, but that I can operate differently that qualitatively I can be conscious in what I am doing and be aware that what I'm looking at on the screen when I'm doing an MRI of a Buddhist monk is I'm seeing from the outside, the outside third person story of what they are experiencing in the inside. And then what, what the researchers have been doing is they continually are asking the monk when he wakes up, what was going on while you were meditating? and give it to us in a timeline, and they become very experienced and detailed. They will sometimes describe what happened and take as long describing it as it took them to go through the meditation. And then they can line up what was happening in the scans, what was happening in the EEG, so that we we're looking at, at the gap now in one person. We we're looking at one experience from a third person point of view and from a one person point of view. And I think that will help. Oh, didn't want to take this away yet. If this is true, if we can make some progress toward that hard problem of how is it that physical things can produce mental or spiritual effects, that spiritual things can produce physical or mental effects, and we talked about that in terms of learning, right? That I can control, that I can control the duck 
the duck rabbit. And I do that simply because I shift my consciousness somehow, and we know how to do that somehow, then we can actually produce a different visual effect. So we know that this is a two-way cause-effect sequence because of first-person experiences. You never would have expected that just by looking at data in a laboratory. That, I think, we can bring to the table. And I think there are some spin-offs down the road to this. First of all, in terms of some theological clarifications, I think we can have a better description of what's going on in mental action, especially knowing and willing, in post-resurrection life. I think we have some more clues than we've had from Scripture and some other sources. I'm not saying they're going to settle anything, but we certainly have more data to bring to the table. We might have a new model of creation that God might create from the inside rather than the Big Bang explosions from the outside, or at least another dimension of it. And it certainly supports a process a conception or process theology of God. What is even more interesting to me is from another life that I have as, as a teacher and a researcher and a consultant in ethics is the problem of the definition of death. A century ago, the legal and the clinical definition of death were the same. Your heart stopped beating. You stopped breathing. And when the physician saw that, he signed the document, you're legally dead. Now we know that that is not necessarily the case. We can have people who are clinically dead who are still breathing, and vice versa. I was talking to a woman at Lutheran. Her husband had just gone through a heart transplant. And despite all the training, despite all the videos that she had seen before, when the surgeon came in and we were sitting there, and he came in and he said, it's going to be three more hours yet. Uh, everything is going fine. We're going to have to close. And he said, I want to tell you how glad I am that we found another heart for your husband when we did. Because as I looked at the table, I had taken his heart out and I set it down in a tray right next to the donor heart. And at that point, she fainted. Because she suddenly realized by the old legal definition, he was dead. His heart stopped beating. But he was not clinically dead. There was a heart-lung machine taking over and pumping, and the heart transplant was happening. So, and we're now moving towards definitions of death in many states, where death is defined in a legal way more and more often, more like the clinical way, that consciousness is stopping. If you remember the Terry Schiavo case, a very clear problem and it's not just persistent vegetative state. That's, that's a separate issue. Those people are not clinically dead. But there are times when the brain deteriorates in such a way that certain, certain functions of consciousness cannot occur. And there may be some new definitions of death that come out of this. And resolving certain moral responsibility issues. I'm positive that first-person first reflections on this will take us away beyond theory into some concrete examples of things like free will and minimal free choice and some of those very important ideas and get us away from uh, some of the, the behaviorism that we've been, been saddled with. And then lastly, for, for some students, uh, I think this is going to make a lot of progress in, in, the, in dealing with the, the corporate agency model uh, that we are most familiar with in the last couple of months since the Supreme Court has defined corporations as being persons with constitutional rights, that they are as much a person as any bio-mental person walking around. And this happens to be groups of individuals that can now own things. I think it's in Maryland or New Jersey, there is a corporation that is running for election this fall because now the Supreme Court says they are persons in exactly the same sense as you and I would call ourselves persons. Uh, there's some interesting philosophical issues going on there. It's not just the legal fiction of corporations being persons. They are persons with constitutional rights by law. Um, and, and philosophers are going, well, that won't last. Well, it has, all the way to the Supreme Court in this case. So I hope that some of those, those bigger issues that are more home, more part of our, our, our experience, our workaday lives, 
uh, can be handled a little bit by this little philosophical adventure that you went on tonight. So I invite you to enjoy your consciousness, uh, to bless it, uh, to, to be blessed by it, and to know that in all of us who live with the grace of God in us, there is the consciousness of his presence, and perhaps grace is God's consciousness in us. Thank you very much.